You're listening to Careers and Cocktails, Career Talk with a Twist, hosted by expert recruiter Renee Fry. Let's get this party started. Hey, party people. Welcome to Careers and Cocktails. Today, I'm thrilled to have someone I've known forever the one and only Carmen Kroonquist. Welcome. Thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll talk about what we're drinking today. The age old job interview question. Um, (laughs) I I guess a little bit about me. Um, I have a business called Intentionality Coaching and Consulting. So what I do is I really focus on helping people create a career in life that they love. Um, by helping them become very intentional in regards to what they do, what they want, and, you know, really helping them line up the tools to manifest where they're going more quickly. I love that. You and I have similar missions, girl. Yeah. And now you selected, we're drinking Joel Gott of the 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon, which I'm very familiar with. It's super tasty. I'm going to open my bottle, but tell us why you like this one so much, Carmen. It, it, to me, it's kind of like a good everyday cab um, that goes with just about anything, and it's affordable. Um, it's a California cab. It's available locally in Hudson and at Total Wine or at Sam's Club or wherever you want to shop for it, and I just think it's smooth. Yeah. And I went online to find out a little bit more. So Joel got started in 1986 and this particular wine they say is dry, long and lingering great on its own. Like you said, for everyday drinking, or you could pair it with a great steak and their winery is in Napa. And I read that they get grapes from California, Oregon and Washington. Um, But their goal is to create clean, complex wines that are food friendly and great prices. So you hit on all of that. There you go. All right. I got to pour mine in my Rito glass, my favorite Rito glasses. And ironically, I broke two of them yesterday. (laughs) Try to see your glass. Cheers. Cheers. Finally get to have happy hour with you. I know. Oh, isn't this good? Mm-hmm. I love dry wine and this like pops on your mouth. Mm. It does. Yum. So what are we celebrating today, Carmen? We are celebrating the first snowfall of the year and um, pushing through the mindset of, ick, <laughs> ick. I don't want to get out and go walking in that to, I'm going to go walking in that and capture the beauty of it and share it and enjoy it and embrace it. So that's what we're celebrating. It's October 21st and um, it's beautiful. Cheers to six inches of snow out of the blue. Exactly. I love it. It's funny, normally I'm really grumpy about it and this time I'm like, it doesn't bother me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I wasn't prepared though to pull out my snow boots and my snow jacket, but I walked out to the car yesterday to go home and I was like, Oh, I don't even have a scraper in there. (laughs) I know. I know. I I was lucky that I still had one stuck in in my car because I was in a lot of meetings yesterday. Um, And I had that first dread of it all coming down. And then it's, you know what? We got all of our winterizing stuff done last weekend. And we actually had such a beautiful summer and spring. I don't feel like I was deprived of anything. I enjoyed every bit of it. Right. And you have the best mindset. Like you totally changed your mindset to think of the positivity in the snow. I love that, Carmen. Mm-hmm. Thank your you. career has entailed helping people find their career and life purpose. What are some strategies to help people get unstuck and take those next steps? I think, you know, for, for so many people, they find the whole idea overwhelming of changing careers of being objective about themselves enough to really take stock of what they're passionate about. And sometimes it's a lack of limitation mentality. I'm too old. I don't have enough experience to jump into this career field that I want to really try. Um, So my whole thing is to start with 
First, just clearing crap out so that you can get clear. Too often people try to find clarity when there's just too much clutter. And we're talking about physical and emotional clutter. So one of the first strategies that tools that I encourage is clear your crap out, get organized. You know, so you're not bogged down by things that you don't love or want or need. Because the process of doing that helps you get in touch with things that you love and things that inspire you. Um, so the tell next, me, like I need to go and clean my whole house of clutter or what are we talking about here when you say clean the crap out? I would say clean out the physical clutter and clean out the mental clutter, emotional clutter. How do we clean what, out a mental, emotional, emotional clutter? is to be aware of what are the repeating thoughts that you find yourself constantly thinking when you think about a career change. Um, are you excited about it? Do you dread it? Um, do you have tapes playing in your head that I'm not enough in order to do that thing that I wanna try that's really big and really scary? Um, I've made mistakes, I've failed. I've, I've screwed up in the past. So I'm stuck with shame and guilt and I can't do something else. So those are things that, you know, too often we linger and not just learn the lesson and the gift and move forward. And the present moment is so powerful. Too often people are stuck living in the past or they're worrying about the future. And what you really have right now is the present moment. So getting people back to feeling calm and expansive about the whole notion of a career change before they launch into it. And that makes everything else flow more quickly and smoothly. And also letting curiosity lead. Okay, I don't know what I want. What are you curious about? What's, what's a brick that you can move toward curiosity about the thing that you think might be fun? And instead of that question, what do you want to do when you grow up or what do you want to be next? It's what do you think would be fun to try next? Because that's a lot more liberating, less scary, less daunting than, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? Which sounds really scary. Like what if I make the wrong decision? Right. So those are some mindset things that I would say. Um, yeah, you don't have to clear your whole house, but if you can get... Clearing up clutter frees up stuck energy. So when yeah. people are stuck, there's often some area of their life where they're stuck. And, and, and the more you can clear, the more energy can flow and the more ideas and resources come to you. Yeah, I'm all about clearing energy. Ironically, I just cleaned out my closet. I think it was two weeks ago. And oh my gosh, what a change. I have... I have shelves that have nothing on them. I have space to bring more stuff into and I got rid of so much stuff, but it was awesome. Like to do that. I just feel lighter now when I go in there, I feel it's easier to pick out my clothes for the day, which sounds really simple, but it really did make me feel 10 times better, even though it took me like one whole Sunday afternoon and it was exhausting. I was sweating bullets. <laughs> and what was the part that was the hardest for you? The part that was the hardest, so you know, I've done a lot of speaking engagements. Um, mm -hmm. I have a lot of high-end designer clothes and I went through every single thing and instead of trying to sell it, I actually donated it to Goodwill. So we're talking like dresses I've spent over, you know, 500 to $800 on and I had already worn them and I wasn't going to wear them again and off they went to Goodwill. But it took me a minute. I like let them hang there. And I was like, are you sure you want to get rid of this? And I don't know if it's because of the dollar amount tied to it, or there was an emotional thing tied to it because I remember where I was when I wore it on which stage. And so that whole combination, commun that, that whole experience made me then just say, it's time to let go and it's okay. There's new dresses to buy. There's new stages to speak on. Right. And does it make you look like a 10? Because if it doesn't, there's no reason to keep it. Right. And it's funny because I, I have purchased things, you know, four years ago that I still have. Some of them I keep and some of them I'm like, no, I wouldn't wear that again because mm -hmm. style has changed and I've changed. 
So Carmen, what are some key habits that help individuals maintain happiness when we feel like our careers and lives have been turned upside down by the events of COVID in the past year? That, that's, that's, that's the million dollar question. Um, I think first of all, it is the ability to embrace uncertainty. Um, I think so many of us want to control, we want to feel like we're in control of our lives. It's like the weather, you know, the surprise yesterday, here we have the snow and all that. Um, suddenly we have COVID. My husband owns a restaurant. Um, so all this stuff is very, very real for us in our lives this, the past few months. Um, but there's always a lesson and a gift. And just knowing that no matter what the universe always has our back, um, what is this on a grander scale forcing us to reckon with? Um, what is it forcing us to learn um, as individuals, but also as, as a society? And I always think it's an opportunity to make ourselves better um, and to improve our communities. Yeah. So ways to embrace uncertainty, ways to look at this, you know, past whole year would be to think about how have you been able to get back to the simple pleasures in life with your family, with nature? Um, what are some different practices that you can put in place to find peace? Um, I like Abraham Hicks um, emotional scale. There's 22 emotions that they list on the emotional scale. And the bottom is like hopelessness and despair. And we have to feel all of those emotions. We're human beings. And, but how can we like brick by brick get up to a higher vibration of emotion? Because once you get to that level of contentment is where you're able to start deliberately manifesting. Um, below that, you're manifesting things in your life by default. So even in a pandemic, even in a time when things seem so uncertain, um, it, it, it enable it forces us to get back to our spiritual center and find ways to find peace. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about the simpler things. I have never been more grateful for the house that we live in, my little family, my husband, my children, the ability to continue to work. My husband and I have both been able to continue to work. Our kids have you know, been able to still do their dance and swim and go to school, which it is those little things that we're grateful for. And, you know, at the beginning, I remember feeling scared just because it was the unknown, but now, and you know me, I'm an ultimate optimist. So I've been like thinking of the positive side, right? Um, mm -hmm. How can individuals embrace uncertainty when we, you know, we might be scared or something? I always like that parable that was, you see in a lot of books that pop up about that farmer who, um, you know, he has the horse and, okay, I'm going to screw this up so we can edit, delete that one out. I'm going right. to backtrack. Okay. Um, embracing uncertainty is realizing that we live in a maybe world. We, we grasp to be certain about everything in our lives. When in fact, when you live in, in, in a, a spirit of embracing uncertainty, it's a very powerful way to live. Then you don't feel like you have to control other people or outcomes or events. You can find the simple pleasures and joy in everyday experiences. Um, we live in a maybe world because we're always hearing different things about oh, the experts say this is healthy or this is not. We're, we're being bombarded by politics right now in fear. And so how can we get back to a sense of hope? And, um, you know, yes, there's uncertainty, but I'm just going to let my curiosity go. What am I, what am I learning? Um, what's my next step in moving forward? Um, how can I get away from being a know-it-all? Because I think that's where we, we want such certainty that sometimes we get in our own platforms of, I know it all. And it gets us out of the space of being learners. And I think 
this year 2020, it will go down as one of my favorite years ever. Not for a lot of other people, but for me, this has been amazing in so many ways. Um, it's forced me to become more of a learner and to really take stock. Um, and embracing uncertainty is that you really trust that the universe has your back, yeah. no matter what. And maybe something will turn out for us, maybe it won't. But, it, but you know, shoring us up for feeling like we're braced for failure is never a good thing either. So it's just being curious and optimistic and seeing possibilities and seeing connections and having good practices that bring you back to center, like breathing. People forget to breathe when they're stressed. Um, we have a tendency to really get into that kind of constricted breath and it gets us into the fight, flight, freeze mode instead of flow. And so just remembering to breathe and trust and answers will come to us. Getting into a meditative, you know, practice, a practice of meditation, um, finding ways to get out and move and enjoy nature every day. There's so many things that we can do um, to embrace the uncertainty and still find ways to thrive. Absolutely. Yes to all of those and cheers to 2020 being one of your best years, Carmen. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Okay, we got a lot to go back to. Do you, when I think of curiosity and how you described what you just described, it kind of reminds me that it makes me think we need to be more childlike at times to explore those curiosities. Would you agree? Like, is that a place to start where, you know, we're all programmed to be adults and we have so many responsibilities, but I feel like to me, when, when you said that, I thought, gosh, I should be more childlike to explore. You know what I mean? I, I would agree. I think that's a great analogy because, you know, when you think about it, our programming happens from birth to about age seven. Yeah. So that's an important part of our subconscious latching onto things before we have discernment. Um, so children take everything in like a sieve out of curiosity. They're learning. They're using all of their senses to enjoy and explore life. And they also find the humor and the fun and the play every day. And I think too often we get into that, just as you described, hey, my to-do list is this long and I've got such and such and such and not enough time. And, and we don't work fun and laughter and play into our day or curiosity because we get into the, hey, I know it all. So I'm going to judge everything in everyone mode instead of, huh, you know, I wonder what that person might be thinking or needing right now, or I wonder what's really happening. Um, so I would agree. Yeah, exactly. What about breathing? Do you have any techniques for our listeners that they could use today? Yes. One second. Okay. I'm grabbing a book. No, that's fine. <laughs> Grab your book. <laughs> I'll just drink some more Cabernet. And the so, nose on this is delicious. I mean, it, it smells. Is. Thank it's, you. It's so good. It's so good. Glad you liked it. So um, one of the, the practices I've do taken a deep dive into in the last year is a book called The Energy Codes by Dr. Sue Mortar. And um, in it are seven keys to, um, to awaken your spirit, heal your body, and live your best life. And I got a lot of this book. And one of them is about the breathing because it, I think I just breathe fine. I don't think about it. But yet we've had so many analogies that come up with breath um, just in this last year, when you think about it, um, as related to COVID, as related to George Floyd, right? Oh, right. The breathing. the breathing. So breathing is your spirit. And part of the process of becoming embodied is finding a way to really align your mind, body, and your spirit. And your spirit is your breath. Your, your breath is your energy flowing through all of your systems and all of your chakras throughout your body. And when, where we have to tend to have stuck energy is often where we tend to have pain, physical pain, 
this physical pain is usually our soulful self trying to get our attention. Mm. Um, but it often relates to the chakras and where we tend to be stuck in our lives. So one of the best breathing techniques I picked up in Dr. Sue Mortar's the energy codes is the central channel breath. Okay, this is going to be really weird to demonstrate this, and I wasn't planning to do this today, but here we go. Here we go. You've had some wine. Oh, so, <laughs> um, yeah. So there are four anchor points that I want to just start with, and what you're going to do is squeeze those anchor points. And the first one is your pelvic bowl. So this would be squeezing at your pelvic bowl, which is kind of at the base of your chakra system. The next one is going to be squeezing right behind your rib cage, right here, as though you were doing a bench press. So you're squeezing those muscle, muscles right there. The third one is gonna be right by your throat. You're gonna constrict your throat, just kind of like Darth Vader. You're gonna do the breath kind of like, you know, like dark, Darth Vader there, yep. right behind your throat. I was wondering, is, I'm like, I don't know how to do that. I got the other ones, but the throat, okay, I got it. So it would be put your tongue in the back of your throat and constrict your breathing there. Got it. The fourth one is behind the eyes. So this would be lining up with your pineal gland and your, your third eye. And it would be squeezing behind the eyes. So what you do is you're running a, a central channel breath all the way up and all the way down through your entire channel. So your entire, what you're doing is you're clearing your entire channel. And as you do that, you're able to breathe into the areas where you feel stuck. So am I contracting everything at the same time or am I going like a flow, like pelvic floor contract as I breathe? I need so step as, by step. As you're first learning it, the whole idea of contracting all four anchor points at the same time might feel a bit daunting. So what I would first do is bring that breath up, squeeze that first anchor point, which is at your base. The second one, tightening up behind your rib cage there. And then the third one, you know, coming up behind your throat. And then the fourth one is squeezing behind your eyes. And then, you know, bringing that breath up, so it's almost like it's shooting out of the top of your head like a blowhole, like a whale. And then you're bringing it back down through your central channel and so shooting I, it out am I, of your bottom of your feet. Am I inhaling through my nose and exhaling with my mouth? Good. You're asking really good Okay. <laughs> good hey, I need to know. I'm, yes. I'm like a perfectionist, you know. I gotta, if I'm going to go in, I'm all in. <laughs> all right. So, so breathing in through your nose and awesome. then exhaling through your mouth. But you're also, as you're imaging this, you're, you're imagining it come out the top of your head like a, like a blowhole and then coming through all the way through and coming out the bottoms of your feet. Got it. And how many times should we do this, Carmen? I would do six times. Oh, six times in a row. Yes. Okay. Okay. Love it. Taking time to really breathe. And it will immediately calm you down at a time that you need to be talked off a shelf or you're getting into a great upset. Um, because too often we don't pay attention to our body signals. And the problem is often when we're stressed out, it hijacks our brain before we're able to think. So this is getting you to be more aware of where are you feeling triggered in your body when you're feeling stressed out or uncertain or scared, fearful, anxious, whatever that might be, you know, where is that showing up in your body? What is that sensation like? And really breathing through that, into that, and squeezing it, and integrating that energy. And that will very quickly bring you back to a state of calm. Yeah, absolutely. Breath is always where it's at, Carmen. I mean, there's been times where, you know, I'm super type A, so I get wound tight. Like I've got this much going on. I have this and I'm go, 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 go. And all of a sudden I feel like my heart is like palpitating. My watch is telling me just breathe. And so then I just sit down for a minute and do some breathing. And then it's like, everything just gets a little bit more calm. <laughs> My brain slows down and I can get more accomplished by just breathing. Well, and, and exactly. 
you know, because what happens when you're in fight, flight, freeze mode, your blood drains to your lower extremities. And it's not circulating in your brain, enable you, enabling you to problem solve mm -hmm. and to find solutions and to be connected. We tend to slip into that protection mode. Uh, and this would be another tenant from Dr. Sue Mortar is that protective personality. That's when we become defensive, we protect and we shield. And we really restrict our ability to learn and move things more quick through, move through things more quickly in life, which often traps us in our careers. Right. So connect. Everything's all connected. I love it. So you've talked about a lot of gifts, 2020 being a great year. What was a lesson of a gift you experienced during when we had to shelter in place earlier this year? Oh, you know, um, so many things. Um, I'm not sure if you know, but um, I got married two years ago. And yeah, I do. Congratulations. You look thank so you. happy. I am. And uh, so for the first time, here I am, a step parent. And my stepdaughter, who was at Arizona State, right after spring break, everything shut down. And went online and she came home early. And her mother wouldn't let her stay. Her mother was so afraid of COVID. So she stayed with us for five months wow. and, you know, finished off, you know, her semester online. And at first I was just a little like, how's that going to be? You know, when we're all sheltered in place, um, how's that energy going to be? How is that going to be for us as a family? And I really think it gave us an opportunity to connect in a whole different way because we were slowed down, because we weren't going out. We were having bonfires. We were going for walks. We were having family dinners. We were talking. Um, I, I really think it gave us that chance to connect as a family. My husband was working from home, so unfortunately there were three of us at times all on zoom simultaneously <laughs> we live in the country so usually it was me getting kicked off even though i'm i'm in the office that's supposed to have you know the best you know ethernet connection um so you know there were the technical things but i think it enabled us to you know come up with our new normal and appreciate the little things in life yeah, what a tremendous gift. I mean, it's so special. And then you, I'm sure you learned more things about your stepdaughter that you didn't even know, right? Oh, for sure. Definitely. Um, it enabled us to really develop, I think, a better relationship, more rapport. Um, it just, it was helpful on a family level. It was helpful for me on a professional level. And it was helpful for me because I went walking every day, too. Um, my husband was home, so I would drag him for a walk. Oh, that's great. So, I, I just think there were things that, that were so positive that came about as a part of this. Yeah, that's great. I know. So I have a competitive, two comp I have two daughters, both competitive dancers, and one is also a competitive swimmer. And we hadn't, we've been go, 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 right? Me and my husband have to divide. He's the swim dad, Uber. I'm the dance mom, Uber. And like, we are two ships passing in the night. All of a sudden, boom, everyone has to be at home. We, I was thrilled because I loved having family dinners every day and we finally got to do that again. It had been months since we had done that. Normally it's one on like me and one daughter and him and another daughter eating, you know, and we all got to be there, which I will always appreciate that, you know? Yeah, no, me too. And, and I think we ate more healthy because we weren't um, eating on the run. Right, exactly. Carmen, what are you driven to learn and share with those who use your services? Definitely mindset tools, how to train your brain that we, we have neuroplasty and we can all be reprogrammed. The whole idea of, hey, you know, by the time you're about 30, you know, everything's decaying and, you know, um, your best days are past, that we can always learn and grow new neural pathways and that we, we have control of our ability to be happy. And that's huge. And so too often people will wait till the, I'll be happy when I get this job. I'll be happy when 
I meet my significant other, I'll be happy when I lose 10 pounds, whatever that might be. And the key is to find your way to be happy now. There are happiness habits. Um, people are only programmed by birth. You know, 50% of your happiness is genetic, but the rest of it is all patterns of behavior and thinking. And really encouraging people to challenge their limited thinking, to be aware of it. And you can quickly remove and replace that. So it's never too late um, to, to change your life in ever increasing ways. Yeah, that's a huge value bomb, Carmen. It's never too late to change your life. It never is. That we exactly. have so much, so much more to do. And I'm a huge growth mindset person. And I've worked a lot on unpacking my subconscious beliefs that were embedded in there before age seven. And I've unpacked all that. It takes a lot of work, but you know, I don't have those negative limiting beliefs anymore. And I challenge myself if they do pop up, I'm like, how true is that? And I'm like, no, that's not true. But it takes a lot of work, a lot of deep introspective work. It does. And, and it takes the ability to be a little bit of a neutral observer of yourself. So you have a thought coming in, you're like, oh, that's interesting. Rather than right away, you know, buying into that thought and having your emotional reaction then drive you into a whole course of, you know, physical action that may or may not be good. It's kind of being a neutral observer. How often am I thinking catastrophically versus positively? How, how often am I talking about what I don't want versus what I do want? That's huge. Um, I see it all the time in the work I do where people talk and put all this energy out into blame and shame and things that they don't want versus putting the energy back on what they do want instead. So um, it's, it's really taking ownership that we all have control. We have free will. That's one of the laws of the universe that cannot be broken whatsoever. But every other law of the universe has the ability to be bent. That one does not. Um, we all have free will. And that is the free will over our minds and in turn, our emotional state. It's up to us. And what we do impacts everyone around us. It impacts not just our families, but our communities in our world. Yeah. And we have the power within, which is super powerful. I love that. I love the natural observer. That is like a neutral observer. Yes. That is a great to, but how did, so how does one do that become a neutral observer when thoughts do trigger emotions, Carmen. So we tend to default to judgment mode. And that's a practice that we've learned usually from age, you know, zero to age seven, because we're being judged initially, then we turn it on ourselves and start judging ourselves. And then we often deflect it by judging other people. So being the neutral observer is looking at Am I in a learner mindset right now, or am I in a judger mindset? And accepting that judger is often our default. And judger is where the, who's to blame? What's going, you know? Um, oh, why the, why is that person so frustrating? Yep. Yeah. Um, or we blame ourselves like, God, I can never get it right. Or I'm just not good enough, or I'm not enough, or whatever. We do that to ourselves, and we do that to other people. So it's catching that and just if the first question is, am I in a judger mindset right now? How can I think differently about myself or that other person or that situation? That flips you into a learner mode. And the learner mode is more what's really happening here? Taking stock. Because sometimes we get into the whole disaster scenario. So what's really happening here? Um, What's my part in it? Um, what might that other person that I'm dealing with be wanting or needing right now for me? It gets you out of your own head. Um, how can things be win-win? Um, what can I learn from this situation? What's the next thing that I should do? Breaking it down to like a, a now step. What's the next little action step that I can do? Versus too often we, we see so much ahead of us in trying to make change instead of what's the next step. 
And so learner mindset is more challenging assumptions in getting the facts. Um, I'm assuming this, this is the story I'm making up in my head, um, which may or may not be true. What are the facts? How do I check that out? How can I give a generous assumption to that other person? How can I give a generous assumption to myself right now? And um, shifting into a learner mode. And that's getting back to what we talked about earlier, which is curiosity. Yeah. Always being curious. Yeah. Always being curious about other people. Always being curious, you know, about your, whatever is happening in your life, be it personal or professional, approaching it with a learner mindset. Yeah, we're coming full circle, Carmen. I love it. We're going right back to the beginning. I love it. Curiosity. Gosh, that learner mindset is so tremendous. And you dropped so many value bombs. I was so thrilled. Now, tell us about your local networking group. You've got a local networking group in Hudson, which you've had for years, right? Yes. Um, I'm better at kind of showing up and doing than I'm at marketing and promoting. So thank you. <laughs> Um, but I've been part, you know, a collaborator with Sonia Hall, one of my dear friends, um, to coordinate the St. Croix Valley Networking Group for, I think we've been around for about 12 years now. Oh, it started with Terry ago. Morton. It's been around for a long time. And, and what, what, what's different about this versus some other networking groups is that um, it's casual. You can have... You can have all the coaches you want. You can, you, you, you're not limited to a, gee, I, only one insurance representative can be a part of this or. Um, it's not a BNI one, group. <laughs> exactly. Um, and not to beg on BNI group because they're incredibly valuable. So this, valuable. just a little bit more in, just a little bit more casual in that everyone is welcome. Our, our goal is to build community by doing this. And, um, so when you show up, it's just casual networking. We provide the appetizers and we do introductions around 6.15 or 6.30. And um, everyone goes around, does their elevator pitch. If you have an ask or a need, you put it out there or a promotion or something that you're running, you know, you put it out there. And after that, we go back to just casual networking. Who so, doesn't like free appetizers? Exactly. And you can credit <laughs> my husband for that with Ziggy's. <laughs> oh, awesome. So when is this meeting happening for the same So time is? it is the second Thursday of every month from 530 to 730. And we are doing it in person. Um, we took some time off with the shelter in place. Our, our kind of networking didn't lend itself well to just doing a Zoom meeting. We don't have speakers. Um, we used to have sponsors and we might go back to doing that again, which just was tricky this year to have sponsorship in the way that we used to do that. Um, so we are doing it in person, you know, in wear a mask or don't, you know, it's really up to you. We're not going to be in the middle of that whole debate or shaming or blaming or whatever, but we have enough room for social distancing in the space that we have, which is upstairs at Ziggy's we're able to really distance that room. Cool. And um, we just want people to have that sense of connection. So if you're new to the community, maybe you don't have a small business, but you just wanna meet some new people. We welcome that as well. Um, we love when, when young entrepreneurs or you know, young professionals show up because we want people to start learning how to connect in person and to network. And I think those skills are often lost due to technology. And now we're going back. I mean, here we are, we're on Zoom and we're able to connect and all of that. But there's still nothing like that energy that you get in person. I really think that's hard to replicate. So I love all the networking groups that have gone to Zoom. And this has enabled me to do so much more, too. Um, I'm going to be doing a speech. Um, I'm going to be gone for two weeks in Tampa, Florida. And um, I have a big speech the day after the election. Awesome. And I'm doing, that, doing that via Zoom. Um, but this networking group is still a wonderful way to be in person. 
Yeah, yeah. And networking is everyone, you know, my mantra, everyone has to always be networking. That's how majority of the people find their next jobs. That's how magic happens. And everyone needs to know how to meet other individuals and interact with them. And people inherently want to help others. So tell us one more time where it's at, what time, and what day of the month. So it's always the second Thursday of every month. And I don't know what that lands on for November, if it's the 13th or I believe. Um, and it's at Ziggy's in Hudson. It's in the upstairs. And uh, it runs from 5.30 to 7.30. And it's an open time frame. So sometimes people feel like, well, I can't stop. You know, I, I, I don't get off work till six o'clock or whatever. We just welcome people to come in whenever. It's an open time frame. And we do, the only thing that's formal is that we do the introductions, usually around 6.15, 6.30. And then after that, we just revert back to casual networking. Love people that, that want to stay, we usually have live music on Thursday nights. So sometimes people stay and network a little bit longer. Um, but the whole intention is to make people feel comfortable, welcome, um, to have a place at the table, and um, to connect. Yeah. Cheers to that. 12 years of that and open to everyone and creating a sense of community. I love that, Carmen. You're amazing. Cheers. Thank what you. What is the best advice you can give our listeners? And then we'll share how they can find you and we'll wrap it up. The best advice I can give to listeners right now is that we, we have an inner GPS for a reason. And whether you're looking at decisions, you know, regarding your career, your health, you know, your financial situation, whatever is happening in life, just remember that whatever expands you, when you're feeling expanded, that makes you happier. Whatever tends to contract you, constrict you, is usually what's pulling you in the wrong direction. So pay attention to those, you know, those signs in your body so that you can then make decisions moving forward. Love Use it. inner guidance. Love it, Carmen. You've dropped so much value today. Where can our listeners find you? Um, you can find me on intentionalitycoachingandconsulting.com. I have a Facebook page for Intentionality Coaching and Consulting. And so look me, look me up there. Um, my email address still, the best one because all my contacts are there is C J C is in Carmen J is in Jean Kroonquist C R O O N Q U I S T at yahoo.com. And I'll throw out my number. My number is 651 497 7178. Those are the best ways. Um, I'm working on YouTube, I'm working on Instagram, but uh. And I'm on LinkedIn as well. You can find me there. Um, but uh, I look forward to adding value to you and however I can in terms of helping you find it, find and create a successful career in life. Awesome. Go check out Carmen Kroonquist. I am so grateful you were on the show. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are thrilled to have made a worldwide impact with listeners in nine different countries. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please be sure to subscribe to Careers and Cocktails on YouTube and drop us a review on your favorite podcast app. If you're looking to update your resume or you're stuck in your career, I'm designated by LinkedIn as the top resume writer and career coach expert. I even created a resume and e-learning course to help you if you want to do your own resume. It's super simple and extremely affordable. Go to careersandcocktails.com to learn more. I also wrote a book called I Hate Mondays for all of you job seekers who hate your jobs and want to love your Mondays. You can go there for the same information. And of course, I am up to so much valuable information sharing that for you hiring leaders, if you want to find the secrets to finding the best talent, I have a hiring guide at careersandcocktails.com as well. I am here to share information and help people love what they do. Until next time, cheers.